guys are fired up to be here. Um, I love that song that uh, Shane just sang. Um, I hope you guys are encouraged to be with the family today. Oh yes. Um, it's just so great to see everybody. And it's really just a great, um, very honor that I get to speak before you today um, and get to share what, what, I've, what I've been learning uh, in my study of the Bible uh, in, the, in the past uh, recently. You know, today we're going to talk about a hero, okay? I mean, you guys like heroes, right? I mean, I'm a bit of a nerd. No, we all are. All right. I love Star Wars. I love Disney movies. Uh, so if you guys ever want to watch one of those, hit me up. Um, but today we're going to talk about a hero. Some of my favorite heroes, of course, is Batman. I love Batman. Batman is awesome. Way better than Superman. <laughs> All right. I see where everybody's at now. Okay. <laughs> I mean, but then there's like people like Maximus from the Gladiator. Man, look, that guy's a hero. That guy's awesome. Today we're going to be talking about Joshua. Amen? Amen. See, Joshua is a book of a great hero in the Bible. He was a war hero. And the book is filled with various battles, various victories. Various war that is going on that Joshua had to face. To give you some resume of who Joshua was, Joshua led the victory over the Am- uh, oh my goodness if I can say this word uh, Amalekites. <laughs> Butcher that a little bit. Um, he was a great warrior uh, to begin with. He was also one of the only to uh, to accompany Moses up to the holy mountain to where the tablets were received. Amen. That's pretty amazing to get that honor, to be the only one to do that with Moses. Amen. I was doing some research about Moses' name. And Moses, I'm sorry, sorry, Joshua's name. And Joshua was previously called Hosea, which means salvation. Amen. That's already a cranky name. Later, Moses changes Hosea's name to Joshua. Which Joshua then means, the Lord saves. If that's not interesting enough, in the Greek, the name for Joshua is Jesus. And so we see a very common similarity here uh, that we're about to see between Jesus and Joshua. See, the Old Testament... The Old Testament is the physical foreshadowing of the spiritual realities that were to come in the New Testament. I think that's, that's pretty interesting to think about. Yeah. That God set up His Word where we can read the Old Testament and see what is going to happen in the New Testament. See, Joshua was given a great charge. He was given this charge by God To lead the people to the resting place that God promised. Which was the promised land in Canaan. The similarity with Jesus is that Jesus was later to come to earth and lead those who belonged to him, the disciples, to the eternal resting place, which is heaven. My title for you this morning is Joshua, leader of the restless. Go and turn with me to Joshua chapter 1. And Joshua 1, as, uh, as we read, follow along and... And uh, I hope you get out of, out of what, uh, what joy I've gotten out of reading out of Joshua. Starting in verse 1, the Bible reads, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give to them, the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon, from the great, uh, from the great river to the Euphrates, 
all the Hivite country to the great sea on the west. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because, the, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous. My first point is helping others to the promised land. Let's think about the magnitude of this moment. In Deuteronomy, it talks about uh, Moses' death. Moses, Moses was told by God to go up to the mountain. And he said, you're going to die upon this mountain. Joshua was Moses' aide. And you can imagine Joshua seeing Moses go up to the mountain. And then just waiting. Like, it's been a while. I don't, I don't, I don't know where, where Moses could be. And then he gets the news from God himself and says, Moses is dead. That's very sobering. I mean, think about a mentor that you've had in your life, and then they die. That's, that's, that's a lot to take in. And then to be given the charge by God and says, it's your turn. It is your turn to lead my people. Take control of what I have, what Moses did not finish. You are the person to carry this task on. I mean, Joshua's life, he's seen so many things. He was part of the slavery in Egypt. He was there. He felt what it was like to be enslaved by a people that were not his own. Joshua has seen his own loved ones die. His own friend Moses die. He's even seen all the wrong that the Israelite people have done to God himself. All the disobedience that has happened to get them to the point where where they had to wander for 40 years in the desert. And he was supposed to lead these people. I mean, I don't know what it's like to wander in the desert. But an hour in this sun, I start sweating immensely. <laughs> and if you guys saw me before the service, I was, I was drenched. So I don't know what it's like to, to wander 40 years in the desert. But that has to be tough. And to think about 600,000 people walking, as, walking together just day after day. Day after day in the sun. I mean, these people were tired. And that might be an understatement. Just like Joshua, a lot of these people saw their own loved ones die. And I would say that these people were restless. The people wanted to have a sense of rest for what they've been going through. If that all is not enough, the next problem is is that Joshua is is supposed to lead these people into a land that is already inhabited. And he is charged to wage war against these people. And that is his task. I mean, after baptism, people say that's the time when a disciple is truly wandering through the desert. Trying to make it to the promised land. I don't know if you guys have ever been in your disciple walk and just felt like you're just trying to mow, mow through it. Like, oh, I just get hit. Keep on going, oh, I just get hit again. And you're just like, oh my goodness. Shots fired. <laughs> and the Israelites, they had a tendency, if you read in the Old Testament, to follow God and then to greatly sin. To follow God again. Then to greatly sin and to do that over and over again. Even times the Israelites were calling out and grumbling, God, God, why have you brought us out here to die? 
We should have died in Egypt where we had everything that we needed. And they continue to forget the very miracles that God did to get them to that point. I mean, as Robbie was saying, how can we forget these miracles? I mean, the parting of the Red Sea. Man, I would love to see that in person. That is absolutely amazing. The funny thing is in our life, we can forget the miracles that God does in our life. As we wander through this desert. We at times can be that restless wanderer. And say, man, I I left the world for this. I thought everything was supposed to be great once I became a disciple. I thought everything was supposed to be, God was supposed to be with me and no troubles were supposed to happen. And then you realize that that is not the case. And you get the tendency to go, I want to go back to my old life. Even though I was enslaved to my sin and shut out the, uh, the miracles that God has done for me. I have a sobering question for you guys today. Really think about this. In your life, have you grumbled against God? <laughs> that, that is pretty... Because even in my life, I've grumbled against God. As I've shared before in my OCD, I go, Why, God, have you given this to me? Why can't I just have clear thoughts and, and be normal? And I have to be seen as this guy who is, washes his hands all the time. <laughs> I mean, I remember one time... Uh, it's kind of funny. I was in the bathroom. I was washing my hands. I used to wash my hands up to here, right? And this guy just looks at me and he's like, you can tell me, who'd you murder? I was like, <laughs> I was like, I was like man. <laughs> that, one, that one hit me a little bit. <laughs> like, I gotta stop this. Um, but you know, being a disciple takes a lot of faith. Being a disciple takes a lot of courage. And that's why he tells them, be strong and courageous. No, no, no. Be strong and very courageous. I like to think of the life of a disciple or becoming a disciple is kind of like skydiving. Who here has been skydiving? Anybody? Watch real far. Okay. Uh, (laughs) I myself have been skydiving. And I'll tell you this. That was unlike any rush I've ever felt before. Um, and I remember the time, uh, it was my brother, my dad, and me. And uh, I remember committing to this and be like, it's going to be awesome. You know, you try to play the tough card, you're like, yeah, man, I'm not afraid. This is going to be awesome. I'm going to do this like so many times after this. It's going to be great. And then you drive there and you're like, okay, this is a little real. It's getting, it's getting a little bit real, right? They start putting on the vest and the, and the parachute and you're like, all right, one step closer, right? <laughs> And then you get into that plane. This small little plane with a bunch of people packed into it. And you take off and you start to ascend into the air. And then the door opens. <laughs> Woo! Here we go, guys. And I remember uh, my brother was the first one to jump out of the tandem people. And I was the next one. And I remember just looking there. Come on, bro. And then all of a sudden, he's not there. And you're like, okay, here we go, right? My brother's no longer in this plane with me. And then I stand up to the platform, and it was the first time where I was really like, I think I want to back out right now, right? (laughs) But they tell you at that point, there's nothing you can do. (laughs) There's nothing you can do. And then you fall, and I remember for the first five seconds, I was freaking out. Like, you're like tumbling out of this thing, like doing somersaults in the air. And then you come to this, this stance, and you're just like falling, and you can almost not breathe because air is just like shooting up into your nose, and it's just like crazy. And then they pull the chute, and then you just see this beautiful view. Uh, back in my hometown in San Diego, and it was the countryside, but it was, it was awesome just to, to see that. And then you touch down safely. Being a disciple is like a lot like that. <laughs> you know, you take that courageous decision to be like, I want to study the Bible. I want to get my life right. You get to the point of baptism, which is the edge, and you're like, 
I don't know if this is it. <laughs> and then you take that leap of faith. Amen. And you begin the greatest rush Amen. of a life that you ever experienced. I mean, to think that you can have fun in such a pure and godly way. To have people in your life that truly care about you. And God gave you exactly what you need. And then you fly through life. And one day, you're going to land safely in heaven. In 1 Corinthians 10.13, as we can go through a lot of struggles in life, 1 Corinthians 10.13, if you turn with me there. I love God because God will give you things or allow you to be tempted in a certain way. But He always likes to encourage you after. And in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, it says, No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. This is amazing. That no matter what you go through in your disciple life, it's for your good and God is going to give you a way out and encourage you at the end of this. Where He reassures you, we're in this together. I've been here all along. And I'll prove myself to be faithful to help you and provide you a way out. Back in Joshua 1, God tells Joshua that no one will be able to stand against you. Every place you set your foot will be given to you. That's an amazing thing to be told. To be told that no matter where you go, you will stand up against everybody that comes against you. I gotta ask you guys in your life, do you believe that this is true? I mean, teens, do you believe that God will give you your high school? Just because you are on that campus, one disciple makes a difference. Campus students, do you believe that the campus is yours? Singles and marrieds, do you believe that your workplace is given to you by God and that you can do great things in your workplace? And as a church, do we believe that God has given us Hilo? See, our charge is much like Joshua's. Our charge is to take a land that is already inhabited. Well, what do you mean that this land is already inhabited? You mean that there's already people living here? Well, of course there's already people living here. But this world is already inhabited by the false doctrines that are here. And the churches that I believe teach with sincerity, but don't understand what they are doing. Our job is is to restore Christianity back to what it is supposed to be. And that's a great task ahead of us. I mean, wasn't it awesome to see Tessa get baptized? I mean, to see someone who decides to make the decision to come out of the world and say, I'm going to live for God. And to start the journey of walking through the desert to make it to the promised land. See, Joshua was a leader. He was supposed to lead the people that were restless into the promised land. And just like Joshua, we are all leaders. Because we're all disciples. And as a disciple, we're supposed to be more and more like Jesus. And that means to be more and more like a leader. And so the question is, is not who's going to be a leader, but when you will become a leader. That doesn't mean that you have to be up here behind the pulpit preaching. That means that you've got to be a leader in your life to say, I'm going to stand up for Jesus Christ and help those that are around me and help bring them to the light. We have to be leaders who stand up for God and lead people to the light. 
My second point is stay on the path to victory. Come on, Turn back with me to Joshua chapter 1. In Joshua chapter 1, starting in verse 6, we'll get a running start. The Bible says, Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. You do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be, be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So Joshua ordered the officers of the people, Go throughout the camp and tell the people, Get your supplies ready. Three days from now, you will take... Uh, you will take cross the Jordan here to go take the possession of the land the Lord your God has given you for your own. But the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half tribe of Manasseh, Joshua said, Remember the command that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you. The Lord your God is giving you rest and has granted you this land. Your wives, your children, and your livestock may stay in the land that Moses gave you east of the Jordan, but all your fighting men, fully armed, must cross over ahead of your brothers. You are to help your brothers until the Lord gives them rest, as he has done for you, until they have taken possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving them. After that, you may go back and occupy the land which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you east of the Jordan toward the sunrise. God tells Joshua, be careful to obey all of the law that Moses gave you. I mean, why does he say... Be careful. I mean, someone saying straight enough, obey everything, is pretty straightforward. But he says, no, no, no. Be careful to do all that is written in the law. Why? Because disobeying is exactly what got them in this position in the first place. I mean, times like building the golden calf going against God and, and, and worshiping idolatry in their life. Forming sexual morality with, with the other tribes that God says don't have, be a part of them. You must be separate from those people. Another question I have is, even I have to ask myself sometimes, and really get a heart check for where we're at, is... What sin in your life have you not been willing to give up? The sin, that sin that will cause you destruction. In my life, I've allowed sins that I thought I was done with come back into my heart. And it happens so quick that you don't understand where the position, the sin is going to take you. In Joshua it says, do everything written in it, then you will be prosperous and successful. See, without God and without the Word, there is no way in our life that we can be prosperous and successful. We know that because we lived that life before we were a disciple. See, when you stop preaching to yourself, that's when you start to weaken spiritually. And so how deep are your quiet times? Do you preach to yourself throughout the day? Do you meditate on God's Word day and night? Go and turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 1. In 2 Peter chapter 1, we find an encouraging scripture in verse 3 where it says, 
His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Isn't that amazing to think that through this world, God has given us everything that we need to live a godly life. I mean, God has given us a lot of things. But some of the things I think about that God has given us are things like the Holy Spirit. I mean, that is the exact power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, which now lives in us. Amazing that we can tap into that power and make a difference. By not relying on our strength, but by laying on the strength that God has given us through the Holy Spirit. I mean, another great thing is God has given us the Bible. I mean, how awesome is it that we can have the very words of God, all of them, in our very hand? I mean, this book is worth more than gold. Because this book helps people come to a truth of life and help gets them to that point. You know, they said that uh, this kind of book was actually uh, invented by the early Christians. Well, why? Because it's a lot easier to hold than a bunch of scrolls when you're being chased away from persecution. And so they developed this way that we can have it all in our hands. You know, I think one of the greatest things that God has given us, I think one of the most special things that we can have is really just each other. I mean, I I look around this room. I want to get a show of hands. Who here is under a year old spiritually? Raise your hand if you're under a year old spiritually. I know we got Tessa in the back. Okay, let me ask you this. Who here is three to five years, two to five years old spiritually? You know, they say that when you're about three years old spiritually, that's when you've hit pretty much maturity. That you're strong and you have a great chance of making it. Now, is anybody here five to ten years old spiritually? Okay. Now, is anyone here over ten years old spiritually? <laughs> That's pretty amazing. I mean, to think... How, how, how old are you spiritually? Uh, 24. 24. I'm only 23 years, 23 years old. She's lived a disciple life longer than I've even been alive. <laughs> I mean, we got to give it up for these people. See, the people who have been here spiritually, ask them, how do you do it? What has helped you to be a disciple this long? Especially when you've been at a point in your life where I just don't know if I can go any further. I want to lift a couple people up because being here in the Hilo Church, I've really just, even though I've been here about a a little less than a month, I've I've truly, from the last of my heart, felt you guys' love. Um, And just simple things of of like Shane and, and Chemo and the Bartholomew's feeding me. I mean, <laughs> woo, that's pretty awesome. I mean, even things like uh, Ronald texting me about, hey, dude, you got to check out this car. Uh, I mean, I only mentioned stuff like that once to him. And he's like, dude, I'm, I'm going to help you find a car, man. That's, that's awesome. I'm going to let you get like some rust bucket, you know. <laughs> and then I think of, of people like Richard who, just meeting him, was so willing to help me work on my car. <laughs> I mean, you know, these things may seem, may seem little, but they're the things that we think about and can look back on to help us to push through. I got a really encouraging text last night from Austin, which I wasn't expecting to get. And it's a picture of, of him sharing at his baptism at the GLC. And he says, bro, do you know that you and two other brothers out of the about five to to six people that were up there behind him, that you three are the only ones faithful still. 
And he said, I'm, bro, I'm so grateful for helping me out. And that's what we live for, guys. That's exactly what we live for. Is that we can look back and say, I remember the people who reached out to me. The people who reached out to me are some of Hawaii's own. Uh, Curtis and Morgan Valdez on Honolulu. Um, and without them, I, you know, and people like Mark Arito and, and even Levi in the back, like, those, I would not be here if it weren't for, for these people. These people have, have helped to mold me and helped to make me grow in my, my walk when I just didn't want to sometimes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or just the times where you're like, they see so much in you and have such great vision for you that they want to see you do something great. I want to challenge you all to think about the people who have reached out to you. The people that have helped get you to where you are now. Give them a simple call or text and say, you know what? I'm so grateful that you helped me so many years ago. They will truly appreciate it. And that might be even be the thing that they might need to continue to press on. See, guys, Joshua was a leader of the restless. When at times we can be those restless people. But it's now time for us to stand up and be the Joshuas to go out now and lead those who are trying to find their rest from the world. The discipleship is tough. And it's going to get tough at times. But we have to help others to the promised land and take that leap of faith in our life continuously over and over again. And most importantly, we have to stay on the path to victory. So some of you might be sitting here today and might be going, you know, I might want to change my life for God. I might want to study the Bible. No matter what age you are, you all go through something in your life that makes you think about, there has to be something better. And so you might be sitting here today and saying, I want to change my life. Well, all it's going to take is to take that leap of faith. And so guys, I want to encourage you that we're in this to the end. And we have to stand up for Jesus Christ and, and be the Joshua's of our time. Amen. So God be the glory.